Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session in American English Live Series 11. We're so excited to have each of you here with us today. My name is Kate, and I'll be here with you today, along with my colleague behind the scenes, Heather, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. <clears throat> Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our third webinar in series 11. Maria Alejandra from Bolivia says, this session helped me gain resources to enhance my students speaking. I am convinced that peer-to-peer -peer learning is much more beneficial and I can have that happening much more in my classroom with these ideas. Thanks for that great comment. And Sultana in Bangladesh says, the session was really great. I learned a lot and will cascade my learning knowledge to my colleagues and students. Thank you so much for providing such a wonderful live program. <clears throat> Thank you for those great comments. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your photos and thoughts about our webinars by adding them to the comments or chat box or by emailing them to American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments or photos during the next session. So throughout series 11, we're exploring the themes of topics and classroom management for in-person, online, or hybrid courses, and innovative approaches to teaching grammar through games, art, and movement. We hope you will be able to use the practical ideas we share. Here's what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and the presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. <clears throat> our presenters may suggest options for materials or tools during today's session or other sessions. The U.S. Department of State's Office of English Language Programs does not formally endorse these resources, though we do hope you get some great ideas during the session. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you'll have an opportunity to receive your digital badge. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you have successfully done so, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, we want to let you know about a new massive open online course or MOOC that begins on July 5th, TESOL Methodology. In this instructor-led course for educators, course participants will discuss and examine strategies for teaching speaking, listening, reading, and writing to English language learners of different ages, levels, and contexts. Enrollment is open now, and you can see the dates for this instructor-led course on the slide. Learn more and enroll today using the link being shared now in the chat and comments. And now for today's session, Adventures in Grammar, the Power of Stories. We all know that stories can stimulate thought, reflection, and learning. They can also make grammar instruction more engaging and effective. In this webinar, we will discuss ways of dramatizing grammar rules to make them memorable, as well as techniques for helping students discover grammar for themselves as they explore popular stories. In addition, we will consider how to make students the center of their own grammatical stories as we help them share their experiences and use new forms to tell their tales. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Christopher Stilwell. Christopher has taught English as a second or foreign language in Spain, Japan, and the United States. And he, <clears throat> sorry, and he has worked as a teacher educator in such places as Egypt, Peru, and Laos. He has edited two language teaching insights from other fields books for TESOL International. Christopher works with teachers and language learners at University of California, Irvine, and the College of the Sequoias. In the past year, he has served as a mentor at Teachers College Columbia University and as a U.S. Department of State English Language Specialist in Brazil. Welcome, Christopher. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Kate. I am thrilled to be here. Let's get started. When I think of stories and language teaching, I think of the time when I was teaching ESL in New York. 
I loved to walk the streets and remember the adventures I had heard about from movies and books. I thought those stories might be nice to discuss in my classes, but I never expected that my students and I would go on adventures ourselves. I was wrong. One hint that real adventures were waiting came when I was walking downtown and I came across a time machine. I never got to talk to the driver, but I wondered if a time traveler came to class, what kind of grammar would we use to talk about their adventures at different points in time? On another day in Brooklyn, I found a store that sold supplies for superheroes. This is true, everybody. They have this store. Now think of the possibilities. I mean, just imagine what kind of customers are there and, and how would they use grammar to make polite requests for a cape or something, right? I didn't know what to make of this, but one thing was clear. In New York and maybe everywhere in the world, there was a surface world of normal everyday life, but just below the surface was a world of stories and adventure and grammar. This was never clearer than on the day when my language class was interrupted by an urgent message about a, a, a grammar emergency, which took us all on an adventure I'll never forget. In fact, well, I'll tell you more about that later. But, and, and we will explore several practical activities that harness the power of stories to teach grammar. But before I go any further, I would like to hear from you. Can you tell us, why should we use stories in the language classroom? Yeah, let us know everybody. Why should we use stories in the language classroom? What do you think? So there are so many different ways that we use stories in our day-to-day -day lives, but we can also use them in the language classroom. What do you think? Why should we use them or what can we do with them? What do you think, everybody? Let's see, we can nurture creativity from it, from Noemi, great idea. Yeah. Because students love them, absolutely, yes. Thanks, Laurel. Let's take a look over here on the other page. Let me I see check. David says real stories are always interesting. I agree. Totally. Absolutely. Interesting. It helps students. It's great to catch the student's attention from Mauricio. It helps students to learn about reading from Saw Sandy. And it can help them make it connections to experiences that they've had. So those are all wonderful responses. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Beautiful. I, I love that, that last comment in particular about connecting to experiences. That's something we're going to talk about today, different kinds of stories and, and how we can connect with our students. Now, when I think about using stories in the classroom, I agree with all the comments that I heard. And I would, I would say that stories are great for engagement. They can make our lessons more interesting. And, and when we teach lessons through stories, it, we, we stimulate thoughts and reflection and learning. And as we embrace storytelling, we improve learners' communication skills. Now, we've been talking about stories in, in the classroom, but what about grammar and storytelling? Well, I, I think teaching grammar through stories is great too, of course. For one thing, it can make the rules memorable. It can provide rich context to discover how we choose our grammatical forms to match particular meanings in particular situations. We get a lot of context to work with. And finally, I would say that it leads to independent learning of grammar because students can get in the habit of enjoying their own reading and listening, but also noticing the grammar there as well. So today I want to talk about this through three techniques. The first is how do we use students' own stories for grammar skill development? I will share an idea for an activity here. And I'll also talk about an activity that can help students discover grammar in existing stories. Finally, we're going to talk about ways to bring grammar to life through drama and story. Let's start with that first one. How should and why should we use students' own stories for grammar development? I can think of a number of reasons. For one thing, it's student-centered. When we use students' stories, we look at the language they produce. We find out where their strengths are, and we also see what they need to work on. 
It's motivating, it's personalized. As students share the stories they want to talk about in the ways they want to talk about them. It's very, very adaptable. I'm going to talk about a lot of different activities today, but keep in mind that if I give an example with present progressive, well, you can probably also use many different kinds of grammar for these situations, especially in this case of writing stories. And finally, we've got two more things here. Learner stories have great characters, our students. And as we learn about these great characters, we build community because the more we know about each other, the more we can develop a positive classroom atmosphere. So how can we do it? Well, I have two ideas I wanna share with you. The first is getting students to share about their lives. And the second is capturing language experiences. So let's begin with another question here. Can you tell us what writing prompts do you use when you want to get students to share about their life experiences? Yeah, great question. So what do you think, everybody? I'm sure you've used different writing prompts for your students to help them get ideas flowing. What writing prompts do you use to get students writing about their life experiences? What do you think? What are some questions that you ask them to write about? Let's see. You can ask them about different memories. Great. Right. You can, you can start by saying, I remember when from Susana. Great. You can provide pictures. Maybe that will spark some ideas about their own experiences. That's from Sandy. Laurel has a similar idea. She can say, tell us about a time when. Great. Let's th see one more. Um, you could even use ideas um, to spark a new cultural topic. Or you could say what they felt like when something happened. So those are all great ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Very nice, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm actually taking notes. I've got my pen here and I'm writing these down. I, I love the idea of asking students to talk about their memories. Uh, and I can imagine that something like that would get students to practice the past tense, right? Or if they talk about what they were, were doing at a special time, uh, that might also get past progressive. I, I also heard the idea of using pictures, and that's a, that's a great opportunity. In that case, we could get pictures, students could use their own pictures, or maybe we could have pictures of graduation from school, perhaps, and students could imagine what, what their day will be like in the future. So there are many opportunities to practice all kinds of grammar with these writing prompts that you talked about. And of course, we are learning about the people in our class and, and building a community. So I love that, thank you very much. Now I wanna share an activity that could be used with these kinds of prompts. So the first thing we might do is start with a question that could be interesting to the students. In this case, I have the question to think about the time when you heard that our school was going to close for coronavirus. What were you doing? Now, this question is a question that all of the students should be able to remember and, and they, they can share from their experiences. We want to focus on those experiences first and think about the meaning, but still some students will be ready for a grammar challenge right away. In that case, we can add challenge. Try to use past progressive in your response to talk about what you were doing at the time. Now students can write for two or three minutes and then we can respond to what they wrote to get to know our class and develop grammar skills. Maybe students share with their partners or maybe you collect their work. I wanna show a, a way that I like to do it that I think really helps everybody learn a lot from the words they have already written. The first thing I do is I ask volunteers to share what they've written. Now I could do this in a small class or a big class, right? In, in a big class, I could say one person over here, one person over there. In a small class, maybe everybody shares. But I put the sentences on the board and then I respond to the meaning. I look at what they're saying and, and I, I convey that they have communicated well, that what they meant to say is something I understood. In this case, the first three people are talking about their emotions and their feelings. And I might share how I had similar reactions myself in a meaningful communication event, right? The last two, we might note that they capture the moment of their experience of what they were doing at that time. Well, that's interesting. 
we're going to come back to that, I'm sure. But next, yeah, let's focus on the grammar. The first kind of grammar might be an easier one. I might ask the class, guys, do you see any simple past verbs? And as they tell me, maybe I can underline them on the board, or if I'm online, maybe on my PowerPoint, I can highlight them if I'm sharing my screen with the students. I might also ask what verbs are past progressive. And again, we can underline or highlight, and we can talk about how are these sentences different from the other ones that you wrote. We can pay attention to other things like time words. In this case, there are three examples of the word when. Now, we go through all of this, we highlight the most effective choices, and we kind of celebrate them, and then we invite the students to make some changes. So we say, all right, guys, we saw great examples of past and, and past continuous and when. Maybe you didn't do that in your writing. That's fine, but please try again. Or if you did that already, maybe make a new sentence and try to use these forms. Give the students a few minutes to try that, and then maybe invite different students to share what they wrote and talk about how they made improvements inspired by what they learned from their classmates. So this is just one approach. Now, one thing that's happening here is we are capturing what the students write and we are getting them to notice the grammar in their words. I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. So the second principle is capturing language experiences. As students share st stories, they build community and we can help them notice the grammar. The next thing we want to do is we want students to notice grammar on their own outside of class even. We want this to become a habit for them. And we can prepare them for that by doing another activity in class first. And the activity that I like is role plays. Now, when I talk about role plays, I don't mean scripted conversations from the textbook. I mean language practice, where each student plays a role and they discuss a scenario through improvisation, right? There's no writing, no reading. It's just talking and inventing, spontaneous. Now, through role plays, students can draw from their own stories and experiences to explore grammar. We could use this for almost any kind of grammar you can think of. I'll give you a few examples. We could ask them to do a scenario where they give advice to each other, or we could have a scenario where one person is asking for something and giving reasons. Maybe the other one is saying no and giving reasons. My favorite, current, my current favorite is predicting the future. This is something I tried with my students recently and they loved it. One student is a fortune teller and they are predicting the future for the other students. And they're talking about all of the wonderful things that their classmate will do someday. That was a lot of fun. Now, these activities are great for practicing language and just getting students to communicate, right? But there is a problem sometimes. And that problem is that students may finish a role play without using the intended language or without noticing it. Maybe they use the language, but they didn't realize it. So after an activity, it's important to give students a moment to reflect. A, a, a paper like this one here might help them to capture the role play language by collaborating on a written dialogue. Now, did you notice that word there, collaborating? That's a big part here. That's, that's one of the great things about a language classroom. If we're together live, then we can give students a chance to learn from and with each other when they collaborate. In this case, they can write the dialogue together. And as they do, they will naturally talk about grammar and vocabulary and, and try to get things right. Now, sometimes students will say they don't remember what they said in their role play. No problem. They can draw from whatever they do remember to make a new dialogue. And that's fine too. Now, this exercise is something that students can use to capture the language that they speak, but they can also do something similar to capture the language they hear. Maybe they go to a coffee shop or maybe they watch a show and they can write some things of what they heard there as well. We can even have students write down situations that have uh, a certain, what's, what's the, um, a certain surprise. Now the element of surprise is, is very nice in stories. Stories often have a surprise, or maybe we call it a twist. And these stories with a surprise or a twist are often memorable. I wonder, if we make some surprises in our own classrooms in different ways, 
would that make the lesson memorable too? Now, when I say surprise, I think of all kinds of things. One kind of surprise might be simply getting students to notice something that they never saw before in a textbook, in a grammar, in a video. But we can go a little bit further if we want. Now, I want to show you a, 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 an example of something I tried in a class that really enjoyed jokes. Uh, we were talking about culture and April Fool's Day, and, and they, they, had, they, they had a funny sense of humor themselves. And in this class, I wanted them to understand about quoted speech, about repeating exactly what they hear from one person to tell a story to someone else. And I thought maybe a surprising experience would, would be a perfect match for them. So I planned an interruption to my class with some of my fellow teachers who also enjoy this kind of thing. I wrote a script and the teachers and I practiced before class. And then, well, we tried it in class. First, in the middle of my class, as you can see in this picture here, I was teaching and another teacher, Phil, he came in with a request to make an announcement. Well, I said it was a bad time, but he insisted. This was all part of the script, right? I, I quickly got annoyed and I told him that if he was so interested in talking to my students, well, he could teach the whole class himself. It was very unprofessional, I admit that, but I gave up and I walked out. And, and Phil, he followed me. So for a moment, the students were alone and maybe it was a, a strange situation for them, but only for a moment because then another teacher they knew, Ben, he came by and he saw that there was no teacher in the class and he stepped in to ask some questions. He asked them, did Phil interrupt your class? What did he say? And the students answered, well, Phil wanted to talk to us. Chris said, we don't have time, but Phil said, I only need a minute. Well, as you can see, Ben's questions naturally guided them to use this kind of speech. However, I don't know if they ever would have noticed it. So that's why I asked Ben to go further in this part. He said, we will need to tell the director about this. Could you please write what happened on a piece of paper? Maybe you can use the papers already on your desk. He pointed at the papers. This is what they saw. And at this point, most of the students laughed and realized that they were in the middle of a pretend story. But the writing part, that was serious because as they wrote what they remembered, they were noticing and using the grammar that I wanted them to use. Now, we could do this with any kind of grammar, right? We could imagine a, a scenario about using advice or other things and getting students to notice it later. In this example, I was having all the fun, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you have a class like I did where they enjoy these kinds of jokes and games, you could invite students to plan a day when they will surprise the class with a conversation that we overhear and talk about. Or we can keep it simple. Remember, surprises don't have to be these, these big um, dramatic things. A surprise sometimes can come from asking students to look at a sentence a second time and see something that they never noticed before. Now, another kind of surprise would be the interruptions that we get throughout our, uh, our classroom uh, lives together. So if we have a, a real announcement from a visitor, great. That can be a language learning opportunity too. It was unplanned, but there can be some surprises there. Or maybe your class goes to an assembly or maybe you, you leave the classroom and go on a trip. These are all opportunities to look for things that were not planned and maybe find some memorable lessons. Now, in all of these cases, I want to make a note that it's often a good idea to prepare students for the language of the surprise. Maybe you teach them some relevant vocabulary early in the class. Maybe you have a casual conversation about something that will help them remember some things they know, maybe activate some relevant prior knowledge. Don't tell them what's coming, but find a sneaky way to help them get ready. Well, these are some of the things that I enjoy, but I really want to hear from you actually. Can you tell us, do you ever incorporate elements of surprise or mystery into your classes? Yeah, let us know. Do you ever provide um, elements of mystery or surprise in your classroom? And if you do, please tell us what that may be. Mina says, I've never used this element of surprise, but I think that the idea 
is definitely a genius idea. Wow, very nice. <laughs> Enam says that maybe you could do a surprise with someone's birthday. That might be nice. Wow, that's a very natural idea. We often do surprises for someone's birthday, but you could plan a, an interesting grammatical way to celebrate. Hmm. Absolutely. Carmen says you could do maybe um, share a mystery. Maybe it's a mystery that's um, something about the school or maybe it's a story. Nice. A secret message from Luis. That sounds cool. Like maybe something you have to decode. Right, Let's right. See. Yeah. So, so any kind of grammar exercise, maybe maybe when they when they get the answers, maybe the first letter of the correct words gives you another word. Like there's a code. I don't know. That sounds great. Yeah. Another person said using a, a mystery box or maybe a puppet. Let's Those see, a treasure, a treasure hunt. And uh, one person said, I was pretending I was sick and the students had to guess what my illness was. <laughs> That's a good idea beautiful. too. And, and Kate, I see Denise says that she's invited surprise guests on Zoom to interview. That's a really nice idea also. Many of us are teaching online right now. We have a fantastic opportunity to do things like that as well. I love yeah, it. great idea. Well, in all of these cases, We've got a surprise happening, but we, we want to make sure that we get a language benefit from the surprise. It's very easy to enjoy a joke or something like that, or enjoy a class trip, and maybe miss those opportunities to learn something about grammar and language. So we want to build this habit of noticing and analyzing grammar. We can invite students to pay attention to language outside of class that interests or surprises them. And, and this could be part of a routine. Maybe students collect this language for homework over the weekend. They, they listen to conversations or they, they watch videos on YouTube or something. And then in class, maybe they share with their neighbor. And maybe while they talk to their neighbor about the language they heard, maybe the teacher listens in a little bit and looks for one or two good examples to share with the class. There are many different ways to do it, but this, this is just one idea. Well. I would love to talk about this a lot more, but let's also talk about technique number two here, which is about helping students to discover grammar in existing stories. Now, I'm gonna share one activity that I think is really nice for this because we can do this with absolutely any story and we can focus on any grammar we want. It's called dictogloss. Now, dictogloss sounds like dictation, but it's not, it's not the same thing. Dictogloss, is something where students first learn about the context and essential vocabulary of something that they're going to listen to, right? As the teacher, maybe I'm going to read something to them from one of my favorite books, right? And first I have to tell them what is the book and a little bit about the situation. After that, then I, I open my book to the passage that I choose and I read. And maybe I read it two times, but this is not dictation. So the students do not write anything. They only listen. After I stop reading it, maybe two times, then they write from what they remember. And as they do, they have to kind of work out their own grammar because they won't remember everything themselves. Next, they can work with neighbors, with classmates to share notes and rebuild the text. And finally, we can look at the original text and compare. Kate, what do you think? Do, can, can we try this out? Yes, sounds great. Let's go for it. All right, I, I've got an example here and I found it on the American English website. This is a really great website with a lot of nice resources. And here's uh, for free, we've got The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. It's a really famous book by Mark Twain, but it is adapted for language learners. Now, in the part that I'm going to read, it's about how Huckleberry Finn has recently been adopted. Uh, he's, he's a young, he's a boy, he's been adopted, but he is having trouble adjusting to life in his new home. And so remember that first step, right? I tell students what the story is, I tell them the title, maybe the characters, and I can do more. Let's look at a picture. If I show students a picture like this, it can give good hints about words that we will encounter. So I, I could ask the class, what do you see? And, and Kate, I'm gonna ask you, Kate, what do you see here? Yeah, let's see. It looks sort of like a window from a house, maybe from a bedroom or something. And you can see the beautiful stars. It's nighttime. 
Um, it looks like it might be a little breezy. There's some nice trees there. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And so as I talk to the students, just like just like you're, you're pretending to be a student now, Kate, I can write the words on my PowerPoint if I'm doing a live online class, or I can write them on the board. And then I, I can also say to myself, hmm, I know they need more words, but I don't see them. And I can give them some prompts. For example, Kate, you mentioned stars. Uh, what's a good verb for stars? Hmm, let's see. Um, stars shine. So I think shine is a good verb for them. That, that is a good verb, yeah. And, and actually, you, you might hear that verb when I talk about this part of the story. All right, this is great. Thank you, Kate. So now we're, we're ready to begin, or, or almost. We're going to listen only. But let me be clear, this is not a dictation. So when I read, you're going to listen only. So Kate, I, I want to be super clear. What are you, when I say you're going to listen only, I mean you're not going to what? Uh, not write, only listen. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so here we go, everybody. Please listen and no writing. Here we go. The stars were shining and the wind moving the trees sounded as though it was whispering to me. I couldn't understand what the wind was saying. Far away in the trees, I heard the kind of sound that a ghost makes. I became so sad and frightened that I wished that I had some company. In a real class, I would read that two times. After that, I would say, okay, everybody, now you can pick up your pen and you can write. And guys, don't use a pen. Please, can you join us and write the words and phrases you heard in the chat? Yeah, what did you hear from that passage that Christopher shared with us? What words or phrases? Did you hear? Yes, Denise says like a ghost. Ghost is a very important word in that passage for sure. What yeah. other words or phrases did you hear? I wished I had company, yep, definitely. Wind, trees, a lonely person, sounds like something about a ghost from Micah. Shine, whisper, those are some words that Sandy heard. Company and wow. ghost from Diana. Now, Kate, one thing I notice is our audience is, is very good with English. And, and of course, the, you, you guys are doing great with capturing things in a very difficult passage. But like I said, in, in a regular classroom, I think it would be important to read it twice. And I'm sure you all would be sharing even more language in that case as well. Now, what happens next is the students get together and they share what they heard. Maybe each one takes a turn reading their notes. You know, I, I would probably put them into groups of maybe three people and each one shares what they have in their notes. And then after that, they work together to reconstruct the whole story. Maybe they write the story on the board. Maybe they write it on a slide or a poster. It depends on, on what kind of class we have, right? Now, as students do this, they get a valuable opportunity to learn from and with other students. Once again, there's that collaboration happening again. And I hope we have a good community because we've gotten to know each other through our stories. And as they write the story together and collaborate, there will be natural opportunities for them to ask about each other's grammar and, and try to get it right. Well, after that, we can compare what they wrote with what their classmates wrote. So maybe everybody puts their writing on the board or maybe it's a shared slide, like a Google, Google slide or something. And then we look at what we have here. And just like I did before in the previous writing example, I can start highlighting things, right? So maybe I'll highlight how they began. Everybody began by talking about the stars, right? And so maybe I'll highlight that the first one says star was shining, and the second one says star was shining, but the third one says star were shining. And we could ask a question. We could ask, well, which one is correct or are are none of them correct? Do we need to make some other changes? We can also look at the way they wrote their closing sentences. And we, we can look at many, many different things. And as we do, we can highlight them. So I think, I think if, we, if we advance the slides here, we'll see stars were shining, and then we'll also see the, the last sentence. And we can highlight many different things as we look at the next one, yes. And now, once we've done that comparing across the groups, now we compare with the original. This is what we've all been waiting for, right? Everybody's super curious to find out 
were their guesses correct or not? Now, I think we should keep in mind that correct does not mean exactly the same. Their versions are correct if they captured the story and they communicated it well. There's, we do not expect them to remember these exact words, and we certainly don't want them to cross things out when they see the original version. But we do want them to notice the ways that the original version uses grammar and vocabulary to tell the same story. And we want to see if they can find answers to the grammar questions that came up as they were talking in their groups and making their own versions. Well, I would love to talk about this forever too, but let's go to technique three, which is about bringing grammar to life through drama and story. To recap, so far, we've talked about getting students to analyze language in their own stories and in the stories they hear. Now, we're going to talk about how to strengthen that analysis by making grammar rules memorable through further adventures and story. Another way to think about this is we can look for the story in the skills. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, let's start with an example. If we want to make rules memorable, we might begin by noticing that students often repeat the same mistakes in their writing. Now, we want our students to remember the rules so they can edit for themselves and, and, and learn, right? But we also want to recognize that these mistakes are very common. They're a valuable part of learning. That We cannot learn a language without mistakes, I'm sorry. So they are nothing to get frustrated over. We should be patient and we should see them as a learning opportunity. But how? How can we help them remember the rules and avoid frustration? Well, maybe the principles of story and adventure might help. For, for instance, we can make editing a little bit less serious and a little bit more memorable through story. For instance, we could seek ways to bring these principles to life if we frame this editing as a battle against common enemies that cause common mistakes. The key is to learn about them and be vigilant, watchful, careful, pay attention, right? So we might imagine that students' spelling mistakes are caused by, I don't know, misspell. We might think that the, the preposition mistakes that we see so often are caused by another enemy called preposition X. Or maybe those verb tense problems were caused by the evil, terrible time killer. Any, any of these are possible. And here's the, the thing. We are bringing the story, th these rules to life and making them memorable and helping students to know that they should be on the lookout and check their work for these enemies, for these attacks from these criminals before they give us their work. Now, how do we do this? Let's break it down. First, define the characteristics of the different enemies, right? Choose a common mistake and, and figure out where does this mistake typically happen? Next, assign names, H have some fun with it. In this case, we, we made names from the world of superheroes and bad guys, but it can be any theme that matches your class. For instance, if you're working with younger learners, you might come up with animals associations, like a, a confused caterpillar who mixes up prepositions and doesn't know if it's on, in, under, or, or, or next to a flower. Anything is possible. Now, since we are drawing this from the student's common mistakes, we have an opportunity to bring examples from the student's own work as well. Maybe we change some details to make it easier to learn from, but we can have kind of a, a corpus, a, a body of student language that shows these mistakes and how we fix them. From there, that's the developing strategies part. We want to avoid the mistakes. So maybe we, we get strategies from looking at these examples we found, or maybe we grab a grammar book and we highlight some especially relevant rules. Now, one more motivating thing we can do here is we can keep track of progress and we can really remind students that this is a routine thing to do in their writing. One thing that I like to do is give students a box at the bottom of their paper. And in that box, it has reminders about the kinds of mistakes that they should look for. It, it might look something like, like this. Notice that it's not keeping track of mistakes, it's keeping track of criminals of communication. And so we have these questions, did you check for articles where your verb tense is okay? And students are reminded to go look for those things 
and they put an X on the line every time they find one of those mistakes and fix it. Or if they're not sure, but they think maybe it's right, maybe it's not, they can put a question mark there. But I think they should also put a question mark in the margin of their writing so that during class, we can talk about it together, maybe with me or maybe with a classmate. This is great. And we have one nice comment from Melisek who says this makes editing less serious. So I think that's true. Makes it maybe less serious, a little more fun and engaging. And um, let's see, Vanessa also says a nice comment. I use superhero comics to introduce comparative and superlative adjectives and it really works. So she loves this idea also. So thanks for sharing those great comments. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's that's really fun. So I, I want to hear more, more about these kinds of things and I want to hear more about your creativity, but I'm going to give you a specific challenge in just a moment. So the idea here, or one idea is that grammar rules can give students the ability to do something special. So this is another way to think about language, right? When we learn a new language, we get new abilities to do things. And I think that's a really fun way to approach grammar. So here's the question, how could transition words like therefore and however give us special powers maybe maybe superpowers i don't know wow this is a really great question i think a lot of us have never thought about words like therefore and however giving us special or superpowers so try to be creative or you don't have to be too creative you can also just give us um, something that comes to mind but how could these transition words give us special powers? What do you think, everybody? They help commun for communication. Great, from Raleigh. What other ways could these words give us special or super powers? What do you think? Right now, Kate, I, I think we're, we're giving the audience a, a, an experience with another kind of surprise, right? This is a question that no one would expect, but it might get us thinking about things in an interesting, possibly memorable way. I don't know. Yeah. Noemi says that it could help us to contrast good and bad skills. Holds nice. your reader spellbound. Nice word there, Denise. <laughs> Um, it helps crit critical thinking. Maybe that I think definitely critical thinking is a superpower for sure. And it makes interest. It makes the um, story more interesting and powerful. From Susanna, great thinking, everybody. Thanks for sharing. I would agree. I would agree. I, I think these words really do make stories interesting and more powerful. And one thing that I'm excited about is that these words give the reader a certain kind of power if they understand what they mean and how they work. Kate, let, let, let's look at an example here. So we could think of transition words as a superpower. And in some cases, this superpower might allow students to see the future. For example, we should study for the test otherwise. Mm. Kate, what, what, what do you think? If, if I had to stop my sentence there, could you imagine what I am going to say next? Yeah, I bet you might say, otherwise we might fail or we will fail the test. Look at that, right. So I never said that, but you guessed exactly what was coming next. We could also say that, Kate, you're a kind of a mind reader here. Now here's another one. We could say that maybe these words allow us to see through walls. Do you see that brick wall there? If I put some words behind that wall, you probably can't read them, but maybe you can, I don't know. So here's an example. Let's let, uh, I thought my neighbors would enjoy my loud music. However, yeah, hey, I think, think, let me see. Um, however, my neighbors were very angry and they called the police. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. See, it, I, I hid those words behind a brick wall, but I, it couldn't stop you from understanding, Kate. You have some kind of a transition superpower. He, here's another one. Maybe these words can allow us to understand strange tongues, languages that we've never heard before. Maybe languages that are not even real language. For, for instance, Miss Evernice told Sir Antigood, these are some of my superhero friends, Miss Evernice told Sir Antigood not to tell anyone her secret. Nonetheless, gobbledygook to goo. 
Now, now Kate, I just made that up. Gobbledygook-de-goo is not a real word, but can you guess what, what I meant by gobbledygook-de-goo? Hmm, I think maybe um, it was saying, nonetheless, Sir Antigood told everyone her secret. Exactly, exactly. You, you, Kate, you've done it again. So you really do have a transition word superpower. Now, keep in mind, everyone, this approach can be used for all kinds of grammar. The point is that we think about what does this grammar point allow us to do? Some grammar allows us to talk about the past or the future or to connect things. And in every case, we think about how will that change my life? How will that improve things? In this case, with transition words, I've given you some very, um, well, odd, I guess, examples. But there is a reality to this as well, because throughout our lives, we, we often hear things that we don't fully understand. In the case of my students in New York, if they were waiting for a train and talking to someone, well, when the subway enters the station, it's very hard to hear. But if they heard the beginning and then they heard the transition word, maybe they can guess the rest. And this is also true for times when, when a speaker uses unfamiliar vocabulary. Maybe if we know these words like however and otherwise and nonetheless, maybe we can guess what that vocabulary probably means too. Okay, now we could also do this for using verb tenses to travel through time or maybe using passive voice to avoid getting in trouble because maybe no one will blame me. The, the point is we want to find the story in the skills. Now, another way to look at ways of bringing grammar to life is by imagining characters who embody certain principles. For instance, we might think of a, a fortune teller again who always uses for, uh, future tense to talk about predictions. We might think of a multitasker, someone who does many things at the same time, and maybe we use present progressive to, to express how these things are happening together. We could also go back to my story. Remember my story with, with a time machine driver. We could think about the verb tenses we would hear as we talk about time travel. We, we could revisit that superhero store in Brooklyn and, and talk about the superlative language discoveries we might make there. Now, in this spirit, I had a lot of fun exploring different ideas for how language could give us superpowers. And I'm happy to tell you that my students seem to enjoy it also. And in fact, they, they enjoyed going a little further with some creative writing. They, they created their own language superhero identities and, and they wrote about them. It kind of made sense. After all, language students are fluent in one language, at least one language already, but they develop new skills and identities in a new language. They're kind of, kind of like superheroes. Well, in this class, one story led to another. And before long, we all took on new superhero names and we reimagined our class as a, a, a super language league. Uh, I was Dr. English and, and there were other characters that embodied certain grammatical principles. For instance, there was Passive Peterson. Now he was an ordinary guy, not really a hero or a villain, not very active in his own life. In a way, he could help us understand the meaning of passive voice in grammar. For instance, at his job in the language laboratory, he was given a lot of work to do. He was delayed by many other projects. And as a result, passive Peterson was fired. Now maybe we'll notice that was given, was delayed, was fired. And that helps us remember something, something a little bit sad. It's kind of, it, it really is a sad story about Passive Peterson. Actually, if, if, I, if I remember correctly, he was there on the day that I was telling you about earlier. Re remember I mentioned walking around New York and thinking about stories and, and then one day in my class, uh, I, I, was, I was talking about stories in my class. Um, maybe, maybe you can remember if we, if we think of that picture of the streets of New York, yeah, and all those great things that happened. I, I thought stories were, were a common thing in the movies but I didn't think they would happen in my class. But then one day I was teaching my students grammar, of course, uh, about active and, and passive. 
And, and we got this really strange interruption. I, 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 couldn't, I, I could never describe it to you if, if, if... Kate, did, does that say attention? Yeah, I think it does. Uh, okay, I don't remember making this slide. It's, is, there, is there more to this message? Do, well, that's me, that's Dr. English, okay. Um, uh, active man, huh. uh, hey guys, active man is trying to contact me. He's in trouble. His coworker, uh, Passive Peterson, is also in trouble. Wow, um, which, which, turn on super communicator. Um, Kate, this is really unprofessional. I'm sorry, I would never do this under ordinary circumstances, but I'm sure active man would not interrupt us if it wasn't something really important. Can, can, I, can I take this? Yeah, I guess so. I think you better take it. Okay. Hello, Dr. English Super Language League. Are you out there? We're here, active man. What's wrong? I don't know how much longer I'll be able to communicate with you before they come back. If they find me here, I could be in even bigger trouble. Are you at the language laboratory? I was in the language laboratory, and Passive Peterson was there too. But this morning, Passive Peterson was visited by a strange man. What happened? He was asked a few questions. Had Peterson invited him? I don't think Peterson had invited him. Passive Peterson never really does anything. Things always happen to him, you know what I mean. What, what happened next? He was asked to go outside for a few minutes. Did he agree? I guess he agreed. He didn't act like he had any choice. He's always so passive about everything. He never takes control of anything. He was brought outside, and then he was hit on the head. After that, he was put into the back of a car, and he was taken away. Active man, what did you do? I followed them. When they stopped, I ran after them. I tried to rescue Passive Peterson. I followed them inside a building, and I slipped down the stairs, and I hit my head. When I woke up, I was in the basement. I found this television equipment, and I contacted you. Because, well, well, that's good. Uh, tell us, where, where I, are you? I don't have any more time. Uh, I sent a message to Adja Claus. He, he'll be able to help. Okay, but I, active man. Hey, goodbye. Wow. Um, that's uh, surprising. Um, and... and if I'm honest, guys, that is almost exactly what happened in my class in New York. I, I think I, I need to give him some help, but before I do, uh, let's, let's consider this for a moment as an interruption, right? Now, remember, we talked about interruptions before. How could an interruption like this be useful for language learning? Uh, can you give me some help? Yeah. If this happened in yeah. class. Yeah, thank you so much. And wow, what a what an exciting adventure we just were on there and a lot of people applauding you or and saying awesome, etc. So let's see here. Um, <laughs> um, let's see, what do you think, everybody? How could an interruption like this be useful for language learning? A lot of people saying that's an amazing activity, star emojis, etc. What else do you think? What could you do with an interruption like this, or how could it be useful? So Diana says you could make the transition from theory to practice. Absolutely. So you, the students can see the grammar coming to life. It calls our attention and is very memorable from Micah. It changes the classroom at, um, atmosphere from Bilal. And everyone would pay attention to it. Denise says, yes, active man used the active voice and they could remember everything he did. I think we, that's really, you're onto something there, Denise. Yeah. And one more, um, you can reconnect students with the class. So excellent, everybody. Thanks for those great thoughts. Really nice, yeah. I, I, see, I see Laurel adds, maybe we can ask the students what happened. And, and I think that's a pretty good idea. Now, if you think about it, this interruption brings us back to a number of things that we've been talking about today. First, 
We're bringing grammar to life through drama and story. Uh, in this case, we can think about the differences between active man and passive Peterson, as you mentioned. This interruption also had the element of surprise. Maybe that's good if the students are prepared for it somehow. In our case, I did talk to you a little bit about passive Peterson and active man before we started. Maybe that helped. And, and maybe that would also help make the surprise an understandable and memorable learning experience. However, we still need to make sure that students notice the language, of course. So one time listening might not be enough. I might need to pretend that I recorded this and, and play it again for them or find some other way to get them to reflect on the actual language. After that, we can follow that step we said before of having students write what they remember and compare with their classmates. They compare notes with their peers. And then finally, we can look at the actual text, the, the script and see what we notice about the grammar. Let's do that now. We heard that passive Peterson was visited by a strange man. He didn't do it himself, right? The man visited him or Peterson was visited by the man. He was brought outside and then he was hit on the head. This seems to be a, a disturbing pattern with passive Peterson. He's the subject of the sentences, but he does not do the actions, the actions in the sentence happen to him. And, and again, we see after that, he was put into the back of a car and he was taken away. Whew. But what about active man? What kind of language did he use? Did, did you notice? One thing he said was, I followed them. I ran after them. I tried to rescue passive Peterson. I, he said something like that, right? And I, I found this television equipment and I contacted you. So it seems like active man is much more active. When, when he's the subject of the sentence, he's the one who does the action. The action never happens to him. He creates the action. Well, at this point, I should settle down a little bit maybe and, and note that surprises don't have to be super dramatic. Big adventures like this they can be fun, but we can also keep it simple. As we use the power of stories to teach grammar, maybe it's enough to just remember the value of variety. If we remember that everybody learns in different ways and finds different things interesting, and, and sometimes routines can get boring. Now, routines can be great when we know the expectations and we keep things efficient, but when we have a good routine, then breaking it can also be powerful. And, and I'd like to say that variety in instruction can make lessons memorable through another kind of surprise, just something we've never done before. For example, maybe using a new way to explore stories and language, maybe switching from a textbook routine to watching a short video or, or, or performing a dialogue with the books closed might be a welcome new experience that allows for other kinds of discoveries and wakes everybody up. The bottom line, is that when we give our students memorable experiences, we can increase their interest and their learning. After all, I like to think about this quote, that life is lived twice. The first time is experience. The second time, well, that's a story. Today, we've talked about three ways to help our students have these experiences about stories that might become stories themselves. We can use students' stories for grammar development. We can help students discover grammar in existing stories. And we can bring grammar to life through drama and story. As we do all these things, we can show students how to have adventures with the language. We can create learning experiences that students will be happy to revisit and remember. Now, I have to tell you, I'm really happy that I had a chance to revisit and remember a few things with you today. And I, I really loved the ideas that I heard from you. And I wrote a bunch of them down here. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I enjoyed your ideas. And I hope you'll be telling me more about your ideas. My, my email is at the beginning of the presentation. I'd love to hear about grammar, adventures, and storytelling. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Kate and Heather, Elena, everybody. 
Really fantastic. I appreciate this. See you later, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Dr. English, Christopher. It was a wonderful presentation. And I see so many people um, saying the same thing in the comments and the chat. Um, what a great webinar. We all had a lot of fun um, learning about these really exciting and for us, uh, for a lot of people, new techniques, including myself. So thank you so much.